Just in, folks. Crunchyon recently announced they are releasing Fantastic Mr. Fox as part of their February titles. This will be their first animated release on Blu-ray, and their first since Akira in 1993. Will this mean more animated films in the future? Only time will tell. The Criterion Collection is the premier home video company and has been since its creation in 1984. They spotlighted numerous directors and hundreds of films and given them the best possible treatment for home viewing. Their last animated film released was in 1993, 20 years ago. That film was Katsuhiro Otomo's 1988 landmark, Akira. Criterion only released that edition on Laserdisc as the rights have passed on. The release of Fantastic Mr. Fox is indeed a triumph, as it seems to have put an end to that streak of no animation. However, even though it's a great movie, it seems they're releasing it more due to the fact that they've slowly been acquiring all of Wes Anderson's films, rather than because it's animated. I don't understand fully why Criterion hasn't released more animated films in almost 30 years. Perhaps because there are so many live-action films which have been neglected or never gotten a proper release in America. This is certainly true, yet there are plenty of animated films which I know need a proper release stateside, especially since we don't know the condition of many of the film elements if more attention is being paid to live-action films. In the essay printed on the back of the Akira Laserdisc, film critic David Shute makes good note of the technical skill involved in the making of an animated film. There certainly is respect being given to the medium, and to anime in particular. In fact, he suggests that the taste of reality and a flash of earned empathy is more promising for animation than what is typically done in the West. It seems that Criterion would have a lot to offer a presentation of an animated film, not just from a critical standpoint. The collection always looks for and or creates bonus material that enhances one's appreciation for the film. With animation, this could be taken great advantage of, showing high-definition galleries of drawings, cells, and backgrounds, as well as pencil tests and storyboards. Even the package design will be wonderful to look at, probably displaying animation art from all stages of the film's production. The ubiquitous booklet contained within each release would have this as well as input from animation historians and even, ideally, animators themselves. The Fantastic Mr. Fox release is beautifully packaged and contains complete storyboard animatics among most everything an animation fan could want. The deciding merit of these animated films, from a critical standpoint, would not just be the animation, but their style and stories. Criterion is renowned for creating beautiful transfers of the films they release. With animated films, a curious question arises. With high-definition transfers, something called digital noise reduction is sometimes used. This can either be used to help remove dirt and scratches, or abused to remove the grain and make the film look like a mess. With animated films, since there is usually an abundance of smooth areas of flat color, the notion has been given that DNR should be used to remove the film grain to better exhibit the line work and remove a lot of dust inherent in cell photography. Disney has done this, but in the case of their Blu-ray of the sword and the stone, horrendous results have occurred. Criterion has never used DNR in a degrading manner to their films, and it seems unlikely they would if they released an animated film, considering it's one animated using cells. Besides, the grain structure for animated films is just as integral to the texture of the image as it is for live-action ones. The one burning question left is, are those at Criterion snobbish towards animation? It doesn't seem like they're snobs against most forms of cinema since they've released films like Equinox, The Blob, and even Armageddon. And now, taking you live to a Q&A with the Quay Brothers. They were very interested in, in anything new that wouldn't... <laughs> A lot of work out there of ours hasn't been picked up, so I think they said they'd be very interested. So it's just a question of us saying if the time's right. Or, I mean, they might have a, clearly they're going to have an idea to what they want to put out. Mm. So we'll see. They've been very open to us about it. So we'll see. As for me, I have a few suggestions as well. Allegro non troppo. One could call this Italy's answer to Fantasia. However, it's more like Fantasia's antithesis. What is accomplished here is something that extends farther than what Disney was able to accomplish. Director Bruno Pozzetto also uses live action sequences to move from segment to segment. However, these are humorous and extremely tongue in cheek. The animated shorts themselves are amazingly diverse and colorful in their styles. The most famous A Nod to the Rite of Spring segment from Fantasia is a gorgeous and grotesque parade of prehistory set to Ravel's Bolero. Many of these shorts, such as the latter and the Firebird Suite segment, contain a sharper, usually more satirical edge than Disney had. 
The segment with the homeless cat set to Sibelius' false triste is a real tearjerker that also integrates some stylized live action. There does exist a current DVD edition, but I'm sure Criterion would do an excellent job with the transfer and probably dig up some great new extras for it. The Plague Dogs I hope it's not a surprise that one of the saddest films I've ever seen happens to be animated. Based on Richard Adams' novel, this is a spiritual sequel film to Watership Down, also directed by Martin Rosen. This is about as bleak an animated film as you're likely to see. In spite of that, this world is lovingly rendered, having the most beautiful animal animation I've ever seen. The features on each dog are delicately drawn and painted, and their mannerisms captured perfectly. The story doesn't falter either, successfully making the canines compelling in their struggle. Since the film has many disturbing and none too kid-friendly scenes, it was cut down for the US release. There has never been an uncut release of it on DVD here, so it would be high time for Criterion to release the full version. The Mushi Production Anime Rama Trilogy In the 60s, the legendary Osamu Tezuka started his own production company, named Mushi Production. After leaving Toei Animation, Tezuka needed another company to output his creativity through. Mushi primarily created television programs based on Tezuka's manga. However, in 1969, Mushi Pro released A Thousand and One Nights, a theatrical animated film aimed at adults and co-directed by Osamu Tezuka and Eiichi Yamamoto. Mushi Pro would go on to release two other animated features before briefly going bankrupt in 1973. The second film made, Cleopatra, was also directed by Tezuka and Yamamoto. Cleopatra is a remarkable piece of animation. It uses every style imaginable, from animating cartoon faces over live-action actors to abstracted forms making love. In one standout scene, in celebration of Antony and Cleopatra's arrival in Rome, a brief history of art is given. Each artist's most famous works, from Goya to Dali, are reproduced and animated faithfully to the style that they were made in. For instance, Degas' dancers are rendered in a gorgeous pastel style. Also in the film are anachronisms and absurdist humor galore. The third and final anime Rama film, Tragedy of Belladonna, is the most decadent, but also the most beautiful. Art by illustrator Kuni Fukai is integrated with limited animation to create a unique experience in the history of the medium. Bizarre and elegant imagery help the narrative flow along. Because of budget cuts, it was necessary that they use creative solutions to animate the story. It is a shame that these films, Belladonna especially, have fallen into neglect. Criterion should release A Thousand and One Nights, Cleopatra, and Tragedy of Belladonna in either an Eclipse set or something similar to their America Lost and Found, the BBS story set. But these films certainly are lost treasures to be found. Macross, Do You Remember Love? I'd love to do a full-length review of this film someday, but to be brief, Macross is an important icon of Japanese pop culture. This film in particular is well-loved over there, and it shows. The story of these characters just reverberates with people the world over whether it be through Macross or Robotech. This film encapsulates so much of a bygone era that it is almost painfully nostalgic. Kentaro Haneda's brilliant score elevates this, and Haruhiko Mikimoto's delicate character designs give the film a timeless, yet aged feel. You'd be hard-pressed to find a film with more gorgeous cell art than this. It is the high watermark of Japanese animation as its own developed art form. Combining an excellence in animation execution, music, and story, Do You Remember Love deserves higher attention than just old-school anime clubs. The only thing preventing a domestic release has been the ongoing tension between Harmony Gold and Big West, the rights owners to the domestic and overseas rights. But perhaps Criterion could step in and, as a mediator for both, get this released. Also, since this film is being made off a pre-existing TV show, perhaps a primer could be included in the package, such as in the booklet or a featurette giving a brief synopsis of the original Macross series. I'll never say never about this film. The End of Evangelion Let's get all the enemy out of the way, shall we? Evangelion is both loved and hated equally. Much of this is due to the confusion about the show's intent. What the director, Hideaki Anno, intended was to speak to the lost generation of those in Japan and also to the otaku, or fanboys, who hide in their own world and don't connect with people. It's a really powerful message he has, and it's even more so in the theatrical conclusion to the series. End of Evangelion is really quite excellent in its narrative. Even when things get into insane territory in the last act, there are still concepts that can be grasped. What the film finally has to say at the end is worth hearing. 
The use of live action footage towards the end to point directly at the audience is something not many anime directors are bold enough to try, but Anno is clear about his purpose and who he specifically wants to see it, something which filmmakers of the French New Wave also did. Animation-wise, this film is impeccable. The big fight scene in the middle is one of the best animated in any country. The sense of weight, scale, and momentum entirely palpable. Yet again, however, this film works best in the context of the series, thus a primer would be necessary. However, I maintain that it is very much necessary to right the wrong which manga entertainment committed in 2002 with their awful transfer of the film. A better transfer of this film must be seen over here, and who better to do it? Angel's Egg One last anime on this list, and this one's a doozy. I was first introduced to this film by a friend who knew of it through the art of Yoshitaka Amano, who did the character designs for it. The director, Mamoru Oshii, made what is arguably the most personal and mysterious Japanese animated film ever with Angel's Egg. This was apparently a culmination of Oshii's musings over Christianity and the doubts and questions he had about it and faith in general. Whatever the total meaning, it is truly a thing of beauty. The incredibly deft character animation and eerie slow pacing in the silent foreboding world makes for a unique atmosphere. The film is short and not much can be drawn from it, save for after several subsequent viewings, yet it stays with you, haunting you with its imagery and achingly gorgeous music. If Criterion were to even get into releasing certain anime, this would be a good place to start. It's very much akin to Louis Malle's Black Moon and the films of Tarkovsky. The short films of Jan Svankmeyer. Partially connected to the Czech New Wave, but a filmmaker all his own, Svankmeyer's films are at once disturbing and charming. I first saw his films a few years ago and was spellbound by their alterations of reality in such a striking and unforgettable manner. A wide range of subjects are covered and analyzed in his short films, from childhood, human relationships, and even sports games. The films of his released on home video have been spread over a few distributors, usually in what seem to be film-to-tape transfers. If Criterion could somehow transfer these from some original elements and organize most or as many short films of his into one collection, then it would be worthwhile, perhaps in a collection like that for Stan Brackage. Feherlofia Hungarian made and based on a famous myth of that country. This animated film is very hard to describe. It has a groundbreaking and unique style that flows across the screen in a way that evokes traditional quilt patterns and even poster graphics. Constantly visually exciting and innovative, it holds the viewer captivated from beginning to end. Also, it contains a wonderful sound of music design, which is perfectly suited to the contemporary aesthetic. Habferdo, or Foam Bath. Another Hungarian film, this one from painter Georgi Kovacnai. The movie is animated, but it's a musical romantic dramedy. It centers around a man having second thoughts about marrying one woman and the scenarios that ensue with another one. The animation is frantic, yet one can always understand what is happening. Even better, this crazy style helps the audience look into the psychology of the characters in a way that, for me, has allowed repeated viewings of this film without subtitles. A lot in this film is done with depth and lighting, which one doesn't see much of even in traditional animation. Some live-action materials even make their way onto the 2D surfaces. Not to mention, the music is an integral part and the songs and themes are very nice and quite catchy. In conclusion, I'd like to say that- And now, some thoughts from Jerry Beck, noted animation historian and co-founder of Streamline Pictures and CartoonBrew.com. If it were up to me, I'd have Criterion do Max Fleischer's Screen Songs of the 1930s. And perhaps Mr. Bug Goes to Town of 1942. Best 